Let's talk about what we need to talk about. We are in the midst of making some major changes. Um, first of all, we started out the first semester talking about service industries because they were the simplest. We wanted to try to get you exposed to the very minimum amounts based on things with the least complications. And then we, in chapter five, added the main complication of goods, called ourselves a merchandising firm from that point until this. So we bought goods and sold goods and paid freight and took discounts and did all the things that merchandising firms do. We're making a major shift in what we use as the assumption for the businesses that we're accounting for. And that major shift is that no longer are we solely a merchandising firm, but now we're a manufacturing firm. Merchandising firms buy goods and sell the same product that they bought. Did you get that? Yes. Yeah. Manufacturing firms buy things, turn them into something else. The good that they sell is not the same as the good they bought. We need to understand that basic thing. A lot of times when we go to Walmart and choose something off the shelf, we're choosing something off the shelf from a merchandising firm. Walmart, as far as I know, doesn't manufacture anything. They buy things and they sell the same thing. But General Motors or a, another manufacturing firm buys things, turns them into something else. What we buy from them is distinctly different from what they bought. It's our job to account for all those costs that we're incurring in manufacturing and know the cost of the product that we're producing and to be able to make decisions from that and about that. Another major shift that we're making is that we have now finished the last financial topic. When we did the cash flow statement, we completed that topic. So it has taken us from last August until last week to cover the financial topics. Some schools teach what they call financial managerial. Can you imagine doing what we did from the beginning of school last August until last week in one semester? <laughs> I think it would have been a bit much to handle personally and that's why we stretched it out a bit. We're now ready to turn our attention to managerial topics. Financial topics are typically more concerned with reporting to others, to outsiders. Managerial information is more about reporting to insiders. This is a stretch of material from now until the end of the course that some of you will take more interest in, will demonstrate a greater aptitude for, will see an application for this will like this better than anything we've done. Some of you won't. That's just the way it is when you get a room with this many people in it. Some of you who have struggled in the past might have an attitude that would suggest you're frustrated and confused and not interested in doing this new stuff. I say reconsider. We're doing something brand new. And you don't know whether you have an aptitude for this or not until you try. Give it a try. This may be something that appeals to you, that makes sense to you, and that you can succeed in better than anything we've done so far. Give it a try. The topic is manufacturing. It was my hope that you would look at your first homework assignment for today about manufacturing in chapter 19 to become acquainted with some of the terms so that you would have an idea, so that you wouldn't come totally blank today, that you'd know a little bit. We need to talk about 
types of manufacturing systems. We're going to focus on one this time called job order. Next week we talk about process. Week after next we call, talk about standard cost. And I beg you a lot, and I don't know how my begging falls on your ears or whether it makes you behave any differently or not. But I'm begging you to try your best to catch on this week. If you're thinking, oh, the test didn't until the week after break, I can just coast for a while and catch up, that's a very bad decision. Because what you're going to hear in class today and what you're going to experience in homework this week is the foundation on which we build the next three weeks. If you wake up next Wednesday or next Friday and don't understand this week, you're making next week much harder. And I want to make that point all day today. But you need to catch on today and allow us to build this foundation on which we're going to build future topics. It's about job order accounting. And one of our main things that we need to accomplish today is to learn what we call the flow of costs through the accounts. What are the account titles? What are the journal entries we make to describe the transactions of a manufacturing firm when they buy things and turn them into something else and sell things that are different than they originally bought? So how about manufacturing overhead as a topic? I know this is introduction, I know this is just the outline, but I just want to go on record as saying right at the beginning that it all deserves your attention this week, but manufacturing overhead deserves a little bit more of your attention than the other topics. And it too is a concept that keeps coming up. It's in the next two chapters for sure, in the next two weeks, and maybe beyond that in the rest of what we do the rest of the semester. So we'll talk about it today. Not enough, probably. We'll talk about it all week long to try to get you up to speed on manufacturing overhead as a concept, too. Chapter 19 is really, really a good introduction. And we're just going to spend that brief amount of time for you to do this first homework assignment in it. We're moving on to chapter 20 today in class. Chapter 19 would be a great chapter for you to look back on and study any time these next three weeks as we talk about this topic. There are some good questions recommended in the syllabus. There are some good exercises recommended in the syllabus that you could do and practice and build your understanding about the general nature of manufacturing. In chapter 19, when it talked about producing goods, it's using periodic inventory pr procedures. In first semester, we use both, periodic and perpetual. But we emphasized perpetual more than we did periodic. And that is true as we turn our attention to chapter 20 in just a moment. There was a homework problem assigned for today, and it will be collected in your first discussion just for convenience sake. If you did it already, good. If you were unaware and didn't do it, you dodged a bullet. You need to spend just a little bit of time in chapter 19 getting acquainted with the topic so that we can move to chapter 20 and get on with it. In chapter 20, we're talking about sophisticated, more sophisticated accounting systems, cost accounting systems that will use perpetual procedures. There are essentially two ways in which we could account for goods. They are job order and process. And this week is focused on job order, but today would be a good day to begin trying to draw a contrast between them. And next week, I introduce process, but I glance back with you at job order so that we can continue our quest to, for you to understand the material better. You'll know more next Monday when I give this description. As we talk about job order costing this week, we're talking about goods that can be identified from other goods that we're producing. Typically, in a job order cost accounting system, you are producing goods to the customer's specifications. Let me give a few examples. Let's say my wife and I are remodeling the living room and we want to do new carpet, new drapes, and new sofa chairs. And we look all around town at, a furniture, at all the furniture stores we can go to, and nobody has just the right furniture that we're looking for. But one of those stores has all sorts of fabric samples. And they say, you could pick your own sample and we'll make the sofa. We can get it to you in about six weeks or so. And we're so frustrated that nobody else has what we're looking for that we do that. And we order it. And we get to pick how high we want the arms and what we want the cushions to be like and 
what we want the fabric to be. That's job order. Or maybe I took my car to the mechanic and the mechanic I use has a big garage and has lots of doors, we call those bays. Could somebody nod at me? You've heard the term before? So they're working on five cars and there are five people in the waiting room waiting for their car to be finished. When our name is called, are all five of us going to pay the same price at the cash register? One's having a tune-up and one having windshield wipers changed and one's getting an oil change and one's getting a brake job. Are we all going to pay the same price at the cash register? No. Yes or no? no? No. They've got to have some sort of system to differentiate between the jobs that they work on. Am I getting through to anybody? Now, we're talking about manufacturing, and that wasn't manufacturing, but what we learn here is applicable in other venues. Let's say uh, a law firm has lots of attorneys employed who are dealing with lots of cases, one of which is representing a business going through bankruptcy, and one of them is representing a couple going through a divorce, and another is helping a couple adopt a child. Are they all going to get the same bill? Yes or no? No. We're going to keep up with the hours individually and do the work to the customer specifications just like we're promoting in manufacturing in this week. Job order is for companies that produce goods that are unique and different. A print shop. So one person walks up to the counter and wants business cards. Another person walks up to the counter and wants wedding invitations. Another person wants invoices. Another one wants birth announcements. Are they all going to get the same bill? No. On the same paper? No. Are they going to be the same size? No. With the same color? No. You get my point, don't you? So there are lots of good examples that we could use. We can trace the cost in every example I made to that specific job. Those costs could be identified and traced to that particular job. That job is distinguishable from all the others that we work on. Contrasted with process cost accounting, which we're going to become more familiar with next week. Process cost accounting produces goods in a continuous way that are practically impossible to distinguish one from another. These goods are so alike that they're impossible to differentiate between. Cans of soup, gallons of ice cream, gallons of gasoline, boxes of breakfast cereal, bread, paint. How am I doing? If we had unlimited time, I'd have you name a few. But I just wanted you to see with me the tip of the iceberg, the contrast that we're trying to draw between the two so that you've got a, a general idea. And now we begin to focus on just job order. We'll have this talk again next Monday about the differences between the two. And you'll understand because of what we've done this week with job order. How many of you experienced the virtual tour over the weekend on the website? Let me see hands up. Hi, hi, hi. Good, good, good. Real good. Thank you. Would you help me? Tell me, some three people, the stages of production. How quickly can we name this? Let's get through it. The first stage of production, Grace, is? The purchase and storage of raw materials. The purchase and storage of raw materials. Tell me the second stage, Brittany. Manufacturing. Manufacturing, where the action takes place. The third stage of production, a new volunteer, is? Alexis. Storing and caring to the completed product. Storing and caring for the completed product. There are three <laughs> distinct areas in the manufacturing process. And there are names of accounts associated with each of these three. If you know the name of the first stage, the inventory account that parallels the first stage of production, would you hold up your hand and name it for me? Jason? <coughs> Didn't hear you. Raw goods. We call it raw materials. Okay. Raw materials, you meant to say. Yes? Yes. Um, I'm a funny guy. My wife figured it out. You're still trying. In chapter two, when you became familiar with all the accounts, 
when you wanted to say rent, I insisted you say rent expense. When you said advertising, I insisted you say advertising expense every time. I made you say expense. And here I am going against my own principle. The book calls it Raw Materials Inventory. And that's a mouthful. I'm content to say raw materials. And it's okay with me if you do. And if you write raw materials in your homework, I don't think you're going to get any marks on your paper because of that. If that's the right account type. If you want to write it all out and call it raw materials inventory every time you say it, that's okay with me. There are three stages of production. The second stage of production is called manufacturing. The inventory account that parallels that stage of production is called Roman? Work in process. This is called work in process. The person that volunteered this morning said work in progress. And the book calls it work in process. I think work in progress is a pretty good name for it. But we call it work in process. And then I, to make her feel better, <coughs> said to the class, somebody else is going to say that in your presence this week. You're going to hear somebody else say it that way. And it's okay. Except the name of the account is work in process. And then before the hour's over, somebody else said work in progress. It's going to happen. We're going to all try hard to say work in process, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go again. Third stage of production. Storing and caring for the finished product. The name of the inventory account that parallels that third stage of production is who's my new volunteer? Let's go. Come on. Too many people know this? Good. It's called finished goods. There are three inventory accounts. We used to have one inventory account. We called it inventory in this edition of the book. Now we have three inventory accounts, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. And we need to know what happens that would cause us to use those particular things. What's going to happen in the next few minutes is I'm going to tell you a lot of details, kind of a story, not really, but to, to get us to understand and feel this manufacturing firm that we're accounting for. And I'm asking you to pay attention. This is the foundation. We use the same account titles for three weeks, the same flow of costs for three chapters. And the better job you do in learning in class today, the smoother your time's going to go. You just named for me three inventory accounts, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. And today I've established already that this is perpetual inventory. And hopefully you know enough about perpetual inventory before today to realize that when we move goods through this process that cost of goods sold is the ultimate outcome. We produce these goods in order to make money from them by selling them. And that expense that we incur, that cost that we incur is cost of goods sold, also the name of an account. One of the things we're trying to get you to see and experience in this chart diagram is what is an appropriate account title and what isn't. These are appropriate account titles. You can see them sitting on T accounts. That's how you tell. Three stages of production, three inventory accounts. There are three elements of cost that we attempt to combine in the working stage. I need three volunteers to name them for me. Who's my first one? Here she is, Brittany. Direct materials. Direct materials is the name of the first one. The name of the second one is, Adrian? Direct labor. Direct labor. The name of the third element of cost. John? Production costs. They're all production costs. This specific one is called, Jason? Manufacturing overhead. This is called manufacturing overhead. There are three stages of production, three elements of cost, three inventory accounts. Direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. Now, I already said this, but I'm testing you. Is there an account called direct materials? Yes or no? no. Not enough people said? No. Is there an account called work in process? No. Yes. Is there an account called manufacturing overhead? No. I'm asking you to pay attention and to realize what's appropriate to make a journal entry with and what's not appropriate. I'm trying to tell you and tell it in such a way that you can make sense out of it. Three stages of production, three inventory accounts, three elements of cost, three subparts of manufacturing overhead. Can you name 
the subparts of manufacturing overhead for me. I need three volunteers. I got the same people volunteering every time, and I'm, a, I'm appreciative of them. But others of you know this. Help me out. Indirect materials. Indirect materials is the name of a part of manufacturing overhead. Grace, your hand was up. Indirect labor. Indirect labor is a subpart of manufacturing overhead. And the last one, Jason, is other. other. A huge catch-all <clears throat> of all the other costs that we have in the factory that are difficult to account for. Manufacturing overhead is one of our biggest challenges to account for it. When we account for this in such a way that we have combined the elements of cost and work in process, when we have debited work in process three times, once for direct materials, one for direct labor, and one for manufacturing overhead, we have all the resources we need to produce a product. Don't be surprised when the book says you finish some goods. We have combined all the resources necessary in the working stage. Now, this seems a little crazy, but there is a method to my madness as usual. When we debit work in process, we account for the actual cost of materials. There is an account called factory labor. When employees work for us, we pay them. We debit factory labor and credit cash. When we assign those labor costs to production, the direct labor costs go into work in process it's the actual cost that go there. It is the actual cost for factory labor that gets moved on to work in process. And when we record indirect materials, indirect labor, and other costs in manufacturing overhead, it is the actual cost that we incur there. If this was going to be actual, 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 then why did I bring it up? The amount that we move from manufacturing overhead to work in process is called applied. Sometimes the book will say assigned. It is an estimate. Everywhere else, we account for actual. Manufacturing overhead is unique. It's difficult to account for. It's difficult to trace to the jobs on which we work. We came up with an estimate to do it. And if I get as far as I need to, I'll explain that at the end of the hour. You need to know why we do manufacturing overhead the way we do. And you need to know how it works. Because it works that way for the next three weeks, this and the following two weeks. Could you help me differentiate between direct materials and indirect materials? Let's use an accounting textbook as an example. May I borrow your book as a visual aid? Let's talk about what it takes to produce an accounting textbook. Name me some direct materials in this. Shout them out. Paper. Paper, Paper ink, glue. glue, those kinds of things. Yes? Yeah. Name me some direct labor that goes into this. Does it stretch your imagination too far to envision that a person picked up the paper out, out of the box and put it in the little slot in the printer? That a person squirted ink into the tray in the printing press? That a person flipped the switch? That this paper didn't do it to itself? Yes or no? It's pretty easy to attribute labor to this. If I want to know what I spent for materials, I could figure out those costs. How many sheets of paper did it take? If I want to know how much an employee invested in those books that they printed, they're going to punch in and punch out at the clock in the factory, and I know how much I paid them. Yes? What about insurance? What about property taxes? What about air conditioning? What about electricity? Is there any electricity in this book? No. There's the cost of electricity in this book. Are you with me or not? Yeah. What about the space in which this book was printed? We either rented that building or we owned it and depreciated it. Are you with me or not? This manufacturing overhead idea is a tough concept 
to allocate all of those miscellaneous costs to the products that we're producing. Help me. Differentiate for me between direct materials, paper and ink, and indirect materials. Tell me about indirect materials from the virtual tour you experienced. Example I used in the virtual tour was, Alex, uh, Adrian? Soap. Soap in the mop bucket. And indirect labor, the direct labor is the guy that puts the paper in the printing press, the ink, and flips the switch. The indirect labor was the guy pushing the mop. They helped in the factory, they just weren't directly related to the job. Their costs are helping everywhere in the factory, not attributable to a specific one. And we account for them differently. Direct materials goes into work and process, indirect materials goes into manufacturing overhead. Direct labor goes into work and process, indirect labor goes into manufacturing overhead. Do you get the idea, yes or no? We're trying to account for these costs, and here's the story. I think the goods that you want are in somebody else's warehouse. How are we going to get those goods at our place of business so we can turn them into something else? We're going to prepare a purchase requisition, and then a purchase order, and shop, and communicate with that other firm through the purchase order that we want to buy from them. I hope this sounds familiar from first semester. Does it? It does. Yes? Yes. And they're going to respond to us by preparing an invoice when they sell us the goods. They ship us the goods, we buy those goods, and we debit raw materials and credit accounts payable. Now raw materials is on the screen. Accounts payable is not. Neither is rent expense, nor advertising expense, nor a whole lot of other things. Capital stock and retained earnings. I'm not talking about all the things that aren't affected by this. I'm talking about just this manufacturing process. Did you hear the entry? Debit raw materials, credit accounts payable to acquire these goods. So we're storing them. And the supervisor in the production area is ready to get to work. So he fills out paperwork to ask for some of those goods in storage to be sent into the working area. Uh, materials requisition. And those goods leave the materials storeroom and go two places. Some of them go directly into the product. If this is accounting textbooks, that's paper and ink. Some of them help. That's soap. Are you all with me or not? All the materials leave the materials storeroom. Some of them go directly into the product. Some of them help. Now, employees work for us. They clock in, clock out. Every payday, we pay them. Debit, factory labor, credit cash. As we analyze how they spent their time in the factory all those days, and they have to keep up with it, then we will allocate their costs to production by debiting work in process for the direct labor, debiting manufacturing overhead for the indirect labor, crediting factory labor for the whole thing. Factory labor reminds me of income summer. Gather up some information, allocate it someplace else. Manufacturing overhead reminds me of income summer. Gather up some information, allocate it someplace else. So, when we have real estate taxes, we debit manufacturing overhead and credit cash. When we pay property taxes, we debit manufacturing overhead and credit cash. We've experienced some other costs. When we apply those costs to production, we come up with an estimate. And we debit work in process and credit manufacturing overhead for an estimated amount, an applied amount. We'll talk about it more. When you have debited work in process three times, when you have all the elements of cost that you need to make a product, surely you finished some. We would transfer the cost of the goods we finished from work in process to finished goods. Debit finished goods, credit work in process, for their cost. Ever heard that word before? Cost. This is why lots of people call this cost accounting. 
we're accounting for the cost of the products that we produced. And by the way, I've talked about these three weeks a lot today. The distinguishing feature, the difference between the three weeks, the primary difference between the three weeks is the amount of this entry. How do you do it this week? We have individual jobs and we keep up with the cost for individual jobs. How do you do it next week? We'll come on Monday and we'll see. And, and then you sell those goods. Debit accounts, receivable credit sales to record the revenue you earn. And debit, cost of goods sold, credit, finished goods. The, the end of the line for these goods. They become an expense now to be reported on the income statement to reduce revenue, to find that income. The challenge is, did you, did you understand the story? Did, did you write it down? And, and do, you, do you have a useful tool that you could use to make the journal increase? How about opening your booklet where you can see what you just wrote? Oh, surely you wrote it. What? Didn't you write it? It's still going to be the same flow of accounts for the next three weeks. Why wouldn't you write it down today? I get it. And can you look at the diagram and say the journal and fact for me that you might be asking a homework? You might they feel you might have to do in real life someday. Your purchase for all materials on account. How fast can we go? Can you keep up the pace for me so that we can do the most today? Or you want me to truly lecture and just let you write it down again? I guess we could just write all the answers and pass them out and dismiss class and you could go back to your dorm room and read it. Oh, oh, that'd be like a book, wouldn't it? <laughs> Adrian, purchase raw materials on account would be journalized how? Debit raw materials, credit accounts. It says so on the diagram. Debit raw materials and credit accounts payable. Make me an entry to record materials requisition for use. All the materials left the materials storeroom. They went two places. Can you talk to me, Jason? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna debit works in uh, process and then also debit indirect materials. Is there a name of an account called indirect materials? Uh, no, man. Where, there you go. Aren't you glad you made that mistake here so you wouldn't anymore and everybody would learn from it? Yep. That's great. Two debits and no credits? No, and then we're going to credit raw materials. All the materials left the material store. <laughs> they went two places. Some of them went directly into the products, some of them helped. Debit work in process, debit manufacturing overhead, credit raw materials. I have two word games to illustrate this journal entry to help you understand it better. I'd like to play the first one and finish it and then play the second one so that we didn't mix them up. How about some adjectives to describe these amounts, Jason? Debit work in process, how much? Um, direct. That is the word I was looking for. Thank you very much. You could have said direct materials, but it's already about materials. We knew that. Debit work in process for the direct materials, the ones that went into the product. And if you're off to such a good start, then I bet you know the debit to manufacturing overhead. Indirect? Yeah. Way to go. And credit raw materials for the total. Now there's a separate word game going on here. Forget that we gave those right answers and try this one. Another way to describe this entry would be to debit work in process for... Some new volunteer know where I'm going with this? Jason! Actual? He said with confidence? I don't know. Actual is the word I was looking for. Thank you very much. Debit manufacturing overhead for? Actual. Or applied. Or applied. Which is it? I don't know. Look at your diagram. Uh, you debited manufacturing overhead. Is it actual or applied? Actual. It is. You were right the first time. Are y'all with me or not? Are you with me or not? <laughs> what if I were blind and didn't know you were shaking your head at me? Are you with me or not? Yes. Thank you. 
So if we debit work in process actual, debit manufacturing over at actual, then the credit to raw materials must be actual. Debits and credits have to equal. That's true. You don't trust me, Jason, you can this time. <laughs> Factory labor cost paid. Jason's on the hook, and you are potentially on the hook. May I have a volunteer who would make me an entry for factory wages paid? Come on faster. John. Debit factory labor. And credit? Cash. Good. Real good. Debit factory labor and credit cash. That's how those people got on the debit side. They're not literally standing there, but the wages that they earned are. Debit factory labor, credit cash for the amount we paid our employees. What if you read in a homework problem, apply labor costs to jobs on the basis of time tickets? Would someone venture a guess about this? Alina? Uh, debit direct labor and debit indirect labor. Is there an account called direct labor? Never mind, hold up. Uh, do I uh, work in process and manufacturing overhead? Debit, work in process. Debit, manufacturing overhead. And credit, Alina? Uh, factory labor. Factory labor. So, these costs that we accumulated in factory labor are now being allocated to production, debit work in process, debit manufacturing overhead, credit factory labor. Let's play a word game, Alina. Debit work in process, how much? Uh, the actual. That's the second word game. I like to play the first game first. Uh, the... Anybody listening to Jason's answers a minute ago on purpose to make this entry easier? Hmm? Here she is. Debit. Debit work in process for, say it again. Direct labor. Direct labor. Debit manufacturing overhead for? Indirect labor. Indirect labor. And credit factory labor for the total of those two. Debits and credits have to equal. Alina, are you with me? Yes. Want to play the second word game? Sure. Debit work in process for? Actual. Debit manufacturing overhead for actual. actual. And therefore, credit factory labor for the actual cost that we incur. Think it's silly all you want to, but it'll have a payoff someday if you understand it. So, depreciation on factory, store, and office equipment needs to be recorded. Every person in the room should know the credit. Will you think about the credit a moment? and all be willing to say it to me right now. You mumblers, watermelon, watermelon. <laughs> Credit what? One person hold up your hand and tell me what you all said. Credit Elena? No. Credit Tyler? Manufacturing overhead. No. Credit John? It is a credit to accumulated depreciation. I wanted to start there because that was supposed to be the easy, obvious part. Is it obvious now? Yes or no? The credit is to accumulated depreciation. Don't you wish you'd have said that? I'm looking for some debits. Let's read this again. Let's start with the second one. Depreciation on store equipment would be debited to... Depreciation expense. Depreciation expense. Depreciation on office equipment would be debited to speak up. Depreciation. Depreciation expense. Is this deja vu? Are y'all with me or not? That's the same entry we've been making since chapter three. But here's the rub. The debit to de for depreciation to the factory equipment is manufacturing overhead. <laughs> That's why we came to class today. One of the many reasons to get you to see the difference between debit depreciation expense and credit accumulated depreciation in the old days and still for certain circumstances. But if it has to do with the factory, it's debit manufacturing overhead. All that equipment in the factory, the building itself, when we depreciate those things, it has to do with production. That's part of the cost of the product for which we are counting. Debit manufacturing overhead. Are you with me? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Good. <coughs> then apply overhead to production. May I have a volunteer and may I have a fast? Jason? Debit work in process. 
and then credit your manufacturing overhead. Debit work in process and credit manufacturing overhead for actual or applied, yeah, applied Jason. Amount. You didn't just say that because it was on the screen, did you? No, I already knew. You didn't say it just because it was written in your note taking guide, did you? Well, yeah. <laughs> for all of those who did, for all of those who did, would you please pay attention and learn this and not just read it off the handout? Look at your diagram. The reason we said actual, 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 actual was for such a time as this. To draw the contrast that most of the time it is actual for which we're accounting. But, mer but manufacturing overhead is different. It's complicated. We've come up with the best way possible and the best way possible is to make an estimate. And that estimate we call applied. And we need to say more about it. And I wanted to label this somehow that when you saw it again later, you'd think, oh, we did that before. So that big old star there is just a, a point of reference. Later, when we get back to that point, I'm hoping you have an aha moment. Oh, yes, I understand that because. So if you look at your work in process entries, if you look at your journal entries, you've debited work in process three times. It's time we record some goods that we finished. May I have a volunteer, please? Anybody but Jason. Too many people know how to do this for us to have silence. Christian. Uh, debit, finished goods, credit, work, in process. Debit, finished goods, credit, work, and process for the amount that we sum on the jobs. We're going to keep up with the jobs individually. We're going to sum those costs. That's the amount of this entry. Debit, finished goods, credit, work, and process for the goods we've completed. We sold goods on account. Everybody in the room ought to know how to record the revenue we earned. May I have one new volunteer that hasn't volunteered today to make an entry to record the sale of these goods for me? Yes, ma'am, please. Debit, cost of goods sold, credit, finished goods. That is the correct second entry. I wanted this first one first. Okay. Goods sold on account. You want on the hook or off the hook? You sure? Okay, I'll say Okay. Right. Accounts receivable, debit accounts receivable credit sales. Thank you. The first entry is the same entry we've been making since chapter four. Debit accounts receivable credit sales. Actually, since chapter two, when we were a service industry, we did something equivalent to this. Debit accounts receivable credit sales to record the revenue we've earned, and then she correctly said, debit cost of goods sold, credit finished goods to record the expense that we incurred, the cost that we incurred from producing this product and then selling it. Are you with me? Say yes or no. Yes. Mm -hmm. I hope so. It's not as hard as you would think. At the beginning of the hour, I contrasted chapter 19 with periodic inventory procedures with chapter 20 and perpetual procedures. Perpetual procedures mean we keep up with it all the time. In order to keep up with it all the time, we need some subsidiary ledgers to keep up with it. This is the same flow of cost through the accounts that we just described. Each of those accounts has a subsidiary ledger to go with it. Raw materials has a materials ledger. We keep up with all the commodities we have in the storeroom, paper, ink, cardboard, glue, soap, and so forth. The work in process account has a subsidiary ledger that supports it. And this is really the, distinct, the distinctive feature between this and the other chapters. These jobs can be identified and are different from other jobs. So this is a brake job, that's a tune-up, this is an oil change, and so forth. Are you all with me or not? The examples I used at the beginning of today. This is a print shop. These are wedding announcements, business cards, birth announcements, invoices, term papers. With me or not? Yep. Yes? Each job is unique and different. These individual sheets of paper in the cost ledger are called job cost sheets. These job cost sheets are the thing that makes this different from the others. There's a whole lot that's the same in these three chapters. There's a little bit 
that's different. How we determine the goods we finished is different. And we determine the goods we finished in a job order cost system by summing the cost on that job cost sheet. Finished goods has a finished goods ledger that we keep up with individually. As we record the cost flow through the accounts, we also have the obligation to post those detailed transactions to the various subsidiary ledgers to update those accounts as well. You won't have to do that in a lot of detail. You will get an opportunity in homework problems to do that in a little bit of detail, especially in the cost ledger. So let's talk about this big, looming manufacturing overhead thing. All hour long, I've said manufacturing overhead is different. And I'd like to try to begin that process of thinking about manufacturing overhead being different. It's the same illustration I used a while ago. This is the official version. If we wanted to know the cost of an accounting textbook or any other product we're producing, we could keep up with the raw materials, in this case, paper and ink. We could keep up with the labor cost we incur. I think materials and labor are pretty easy to associate with this finished product. But it's all those miscellaneous costs that give us fits. How much electricity? How much insurance? How much property tax? How much soap? How much rent? How much depreciation? It's allocating those costs to the finished product that are much more difficult. One way we could do this, perhaps the most reliable way, would be to wait until the end of the year. Once you know all the costs for all year, you also know all the units you've produced, so why not divide all the costs by all the units? That would be a very reliable answer. Don't you agree? Yeah. That's about as accurate as we could get. The biggest flaw with that is, in this information age in which we live, are you willing to wait until the end of the year to know the cost of the product you're producing? You could be selling the product all year long for less than the cost you're incurring. What a catastrophe that could be. The weakness of this is the information would be old, stale, expired, not timely. We need to know information more often than that. Well, then let's think of an alternative. How about we just allocate the actual cost that we incur? All the other things use actual, let's just use actual. So last month, there was no insurance in this book that we printed. We printed this book, uh, book, books this month and got an insurance bill. So we put all the insurance in the books we print this month and next month we don't have any insurance again. So last month the employee got a pat on the back, way to go for holding costs down. And this month he got written up and put a comment in his personnel file because costs shot through the roof. Anybody listening to the story? Mm -hmm. Y'all still with me or not? And next month he got a bonus for holding down cost again. Did he deserve a bonus next month? No. These were just accounting inequities. Allocating actual cost on a month-to-month -month basis distorts the comparability of the product cost. We would like to get unit costs that are comparable, that just barely wiggle just a little bit. None of this peaks and valley stuff. If we can keep it kind of close, then we can truly watch it and manage when costs get out of line. We can find out why. All right, think with me about this quick, crazy example. What about having two plants? I'm talking about comparing products from month to month, year to year. You can't see it very well. Don't worry about it. It's a US map and has two cities, um, Bismarck and Brownsville. Pretend with me we've got a production facility in both of these. And here we are at the beginning of March, gathering together to have a board of directors meeting. The staff's been working hard to report results for us for the month of February. How do you think the plants in Bismarck and Brownsville are going to compare 
for the month of February. What do you know about Bismarck? It's going to be cold. They're going to have the heater turned way up, and it's still going to be a teeth-chattering kind of work with your coat on production. What do y'all know about Brownsville? It's really nice. They probably got the windows propped open, and they're all just whistling, enjoying. <laughs> you know, birds are singing. They're just working up a storm. Well, how does that translate to utility cost? We're going to spend a whole lot more in Bismarck for heating the plant than we are in Brownsville, don't you think? Can we compare the results, the performance in these two factories? No. Eliminate one mentally. If you just had one of these facilities, could you compare the results of February with, say, August? What do you know about Bismarck in August? They're going to prop the windows open and whistle while they work. <laughs> Did I say Bismarck or Brownsville? You said Bismarck. Bismarck. What do y'all know about Brownsville in August? Hot. I don't think you can imagine how hot it's going to be in Brownsville in August. We're going to turn the air conditioner up as fast as it'll go, full blast. And it's, we're still going to be sweating like things. Yes? Can we compare the results of these two plants in February? No. August? No. One plant, February to August? No. Because these seasonal fluctuations are going to cause spikes and valleys in what we achieve if we use the fallacy actual cost on a month to month basis. A allocating actual cost on a month to month basis, the differences in the cost incurred, some of them seasonal, would distort the unit cost of the product that you produced. Would distort the unit cost. And my goal at the very beginning of this was to get comparable cost. Cost that we could use to make decisions. That would be good information on which we can base decisions. And these are not good ways to do it. So, what alternative do we have then but to consider perhaps the best of each of these? The good thing about the first proposal, waiting until the end of the year to know all the cost, was knowing all the cost. But we couldn't wait until the end of the year. So how about we put that at the beginning of the year? Let's have all the cost at the beginning of the year. Well, how can you know that? You got some crystal ball to look in to know what all the costs are going to be? It's an estimate. Let's estimate the cost at the beginning of the year based on our past performance, based on what we think we're going to produce this year. Let's estimate it. Um, it's an estimate. Now, let's think about how we're going to take all the cost of overhead and allocate them to the months, to the products that we produce. My suggestion is let's divide by 12. Would it work to put the same amount of factory overhead costs in every month? Probably not. Yes or no? no? If I produce the same number of goods every month, this is a perfectly acceptable way to do it. If I produce a thousand units, 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 it'll work. What are the chances I'm going to produce a thousand units every month? I hope not very good. I think we should have a, a production budget that would dictate the amount that we need to produce. That's another topic, another day, another time. Let's take the total of all the costs that we estimate at the beginning of the year and divide it by something that will change as production changes. Let's divide it by a base, a driver, something that changes as production changes. What I'm about to describe to you is called a predetermined overhead rate. And by the end of the week, you should be familiar with the term. By the end of this discussion, you ought to be more familiar with how to get it. That's where we're going. We want to divide by something that changes as production changes. So what you saw on the screen, formally, saw here on the board, formally is 
estimated overhead for the whole year divided by an activity base, an activity driver with the keyword there being activity, an activity that will vary as production varies. Here's some simple questions for you. If I produce 500 units this month and 1,000 units next month, what's going to happen to direct materials? How much? In what proportion? I'm going to use twice as many materials. Agree? Mm -hmm. If I produce 500 units this month and 1,000 units next month, What's going to happen to labor? It's going to be twice as much, probably. Theoretically speaking, it would take twice as much labor to produce twice as many units. Well, that's the kind of thing we want to have here. We want to tie it to something that changes with output. There are three possibilities. We could tie it to direct labor for the same reason I just said. If labor changes, then the amount of overhead we apply to production changes. We could base it on labor hours. Labor dollars, labor, labor hours. Same rationale. I'm not going to take the time to explain which of these would be better or the circumstances that would dictate it right now. Or machine hours. If I produce 500 units this month and 1,000 units next month, how long is the machine going to run? Twice as, twice as long. That's the point. So every month, as the level of production changes, the amount of overhead that we'll allocate in total will change. But as you divide, the answer by the number of units you produce will get a comparable unit cost from month to month. Then a manager can say, oh, it took you $3.80 last month to produce the product, and you did it this month for $3.75? Way to go. Pat on the back. Took you $3.80 to produce the product last month, and it's $3.90 this month? What's going on? Do you see my point? Now we've got a comparable amount that we can use for decision purposes. We can make this into a management thing. Now, you're supposed to know by now that once you've determined the rate, Whatever you used as the denominator, whatever you used as the driver, you're looking for that actual activity that month. If you tie this to direct labor, then you multiply by direct labor that month. If you tie this to the machine, you multiply by that by the machine hours this month. And I don't have to say the third one. That becomes the estimate. That becomes the basis for the journal entry that surely you know how to make by now. It is debit work in process, credit manufacturing overhead for the applied amount. 